Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the Decoding Food Labels session. Um, we're really excited to have you here, and I'm really excited to be here. My name's Urvashi Rangan. Uh, I work at Consumer Reports. I've been there about 17 years, and I run our Food Safety and Sustainability Division. Part of that is also rating labels. In fact, I came to Consumer Reports um, to rate labels. And so I'm especially excited today to be moderating this panel with really two very progressive players in the industry um, around food labeling. And um, my first guest is Walter Robb. Walter is the co-CEO of Whole Foods Market. It's a position he's had um, since 2010, and he's also a member of the board. He joined the company in 1991 after a long career uh, in natural foods retail. This is really boring. It is a little bit boring, but I just <laughs> want to make sure I do the introductions properly. So um, Walter is really a great representative to have here. Whole Foods is obviously um, an entity known to lots of people, especially those shopping for sustainable food. So we're really happy to have you Thank here, you. Walter. Thank you. Um, Jeff, Jeffrey, Jeff? Yes. Jeff, great. Jeff Dunn is the president of Campbell's Fresh, and um, he's also in charge of building the company scale and accelerating growth for the packaged fresh retail segment. We're going to ask him some questions across the board on Campbell's. Um, from 2008 to 2015, you were the president of Bolt House Farms. Um, is that a different Different company than Campbell's or also? No, no like Campbell's those. bought it from, it was a private equity backed company that I was running and they bought the company four years ago and I came to Campbell's and we we're using it to build out a fresh platform. Right. So um, you've been in this business for a while and Jeff's, one of Jeff's claim to fame was getting kids to eat baby carrots by advertising that they should eat them like junk food and seeing the sales of those carrots go up. So Jeff, thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, I am going to play moderator and also play a little bit of participant because I have played in the sandbox for a long time. Um, like I said, I've been working on food labels for many years, and we've been rating labels for consumers for many years. And if I could have the first slide up, please. Um, I don't want you to read it. I just want you to kind of see the, the comprehensivity behind it. And if you go on to greenerchoices.org, we have all of this stuff for free posted. It's all part of our public education and mission to promote a sustainable marketplace. But we try to give consumers uh, really detailed ratings about different labels that you're seeing. In this case, you'll see uh, biodynamic, organic, the GAP certification programs at Whole Foods and the steps, and really across very detailed criteria across sustainability. It's about feed, drug use, is it verified? Uh, what are the animal welfare standards? And really grading labels in those different spaces. Um, there's a lot of labels out there today and it's really hard for consumers to tell whether they mean anything or whether they don't. So that's sort of my background and um, the work that uh, we sort of bring to the table um, in terms of this. We also know there's a lot of green noise on the market and that that makes for a murky market. If you don't know which labels mean something, it's hard for the credible labels in the market to succeed. So we're going to dig down onto these issues today about meaningful labels, what that means to each of you and your businesses, um, and then get down to some murkiness in the marketplace and, and how uh, you all are interacting with that and, and some tough questions on maybe what you all could be doing even more and some ideas for that. So. Um, I want to go to the next slide, and I think I have control over that. We also run a lot of national survey polls at Consumer Reports, and it's really exciting because we're able to take the pulse of what you all think, but on a national, statistically significant basis. And we're able to marry that to our work. Um, we do a lot of policy advocacy work as well. But what this slide shows you is uh, an overwhelming mandate for better production practices out of food. You know, when we run auto reliability surveys, which we do a lot, and we ask people, is your automobile reliable? If they tell, if 75% of people say their automobile is reliable, that's a go, that's an, a reliable automobile. You're looking at overwhelming number responses here. 91% of people want to support their local farmers. That's huge. Um, and we're also seeing people who want to reduce pesticide exposure, but also support workers, fair pay, working conditions, um, protecting the environment from chemicals, better living conditions for animals. These are things that are not necessarily related to the health of the person themselves. And that's the shift we're seeing in the marketplace over all these years. People use 
used to buy green because they thought it was healthier for them. We're now a little more sophisticated about our thinking and buying things for broader reasons. So with that, um, I'd like to um, start our interview. And Walter, I'd like to start it with you. Whole Foods has done a lot around a lot of these values um, that consumers have when they want to shop. You've educated consumers. You promote a lot of meaningful labels in the market both in terms of third-party labels as well as your own labeling programs. And um, you cover lots of areas, environmental sustainability, animal welfare, worker justice. So could you describe a little bit about the importance of meaningful labels to you for consumers? What makes a good label to you? What makes a bad label for you? And uh, you've developed some labeling programs yourself, and I can't imagine that's very easy. And um, so we don't have a lot of time, but if you could dig in a little bit into the Whole Food Responsible label and some of the challenges you had around that. You held an amazing multi-stakeholder meeting that I was at. Um, I really appreciate the sort of openness Whole Foods has had about this. Could you give us a little landscape um, in answering some of those questions? That's a long question. In five minutes or less, Walter. <laughs> Thank you. Morning, everybody. Um, I think first I'll say, what, you know, what are standards? They are, for us, they are the reflection of our purpose as a company put into action. So if we're, we're about bringing healthier food to the world and creating a company based on love and respect, the tangible way in which that purpose and the values of the company can be expressed is through taking a point of view on the standards of the food that we sell. And starting in 1980, uh, we, our first standard was really around no additive colors, preservatives, and artificial ingredients, and from there, We've built a series of standards over the years, 36 years later, that pretty much touch most of the areas. And um, if you think about it, it's, 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 you know, for example, we were the first to uh, say no hydrogenated uh, fats and uh, no BPA in the, in, the, in the infants' baby bottles. These are some where the government has said uh, it didn't matter, and then four or five or six years later said, well, it does, and it turns out it matters. So does everyone know BPA? Do, does anyone not know that issue? It's been a while, so. Okay. The point is the standards become the way that you can make your point of view clear into the marketplace and affect both the producers and also the customers. So why is a label meaningful? Because it represents a stake in the ground around production practices and around label claims. And for us, um, a meaningful label is first that it has to have a meaningful standard. You mentioned that there are a number of labels out there now that are, that are really hard to understand and they're in the same space and it's confusing to customers. You know, which ones do I trust, which ones I don't trust. So for us, it starts with doing the real work, the stakeholder work to determine what is the real issue and what, what's the point of view that you want to express in your standard. For us right now, you mentioned the responsibly grown produce. There's a lot of conventional produce sold in the, in the country that there's no standards for it at all, other than the minimum USDA pesticide standards, which are pretty minimum and very rarely inspected. So we're trying to, with the responsibly grown system, sweep up including organic, but also address the conventionally grown produce into a much wider basis, look at farm worker health, waste, water, soil health, which should be talked about in any sort of production practices. And it's 42 categories. You know, we stumbled a bit coming out because we misfired on a couple of things. The, the producers helped to put us back on track. But ultimately, the, the, the arc of the world going forward is gonna involve transparency, accountability, responsibility. And the standards are a way that you can advance that arc um, to hold yourself to a higher standard, to hold the market to a higher standard, and move the production standards forward. So uh, maybe you want me to stop there. I, don't, I lost that track of where I was I in the question. That, that, but, uh, that's great. Thank you, Walter. Yeah, I, I would just say a meaningful label. It's got to have a real standard. Mm -hmm. It's got to have, in our view, a third-party audit to confirm. No one's going to believe that you're saying it without somebody checking your work. And so that is a very, that's a point of difference for us with other folks, but a third party audit. And I think a reasonable uh, label claim, something that's easy for the customers to understand. Yeah. All three of those pieces are necessary to have it be a good label. And just quickly, Walter, could you comment on your value tier labeling systems around yeah. uh, GAP, say for meat, sure. um, or your seafood labeling program? Yeah, what she's referencing is in, in several of our labels for whole body products, uh, for produce now, and also for particularly our meat products, we've actually established a tier where the, where the supplier can continue to progress and improve. And what's been really interesting is to note how the competition and also the incentives of the carrot, the Bolthouse carrot, um, has really uh, <clears throat> encouraged the growers to make those improvements step by step as they can. So at this point, 
as we see right now, almost 60% of our beef is step four or pasture-raised beef, which I never would have expected many, many years ago. What did right? it start as? Uh, we started at, I mean, there was, I mean, who even knew what pasture beef was, yeah. right? I mean, it wasn't really out in the marketplace. And it's still the, there is no still label claim when you say pasture-raised milk or dairy or eggs. There's no USDA standard for what that is. We have a standard, but there's no, you know, a claim standard for what that actually represents. But what I'm, my point is that by giving the producers an incentive yeah. so they can, they can label their product step one, step two, step three, four, what we've seen is the movement and the migration of producers who are looking for differentiation, who are looking for extra premium in the market to be recognized for their production practices. So it kind of been, it's kind of been an eye-opener to see how uh, for in the whole body we have our, our standard where you can't use 50 ingredients. In our premium standard, you can't use 400 ingredients. What's been amazing to see is how many manufacturers have pivoted to want to get to the premium label uh, as they want to avoid, and they want that higher standard in the market. That's really great. We'll dig down a little so bit. So carrots instead of carrots instead of sticks, basically. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Thank you, um, Jeff. You represent um, a food manufacturer. You're not the largest food manufacturer by any means, but you're a relatively large manufacturer. Um, and Campbell's has been pretty progressive about a couple mm -hmm. of things. You have. Um, some lines that are labeled, you have an organic line, um, you're looking into GMO labeling, BPA labeling. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're labeling for BPA, but certainly changing over formulations. Um, <laughs> and you also, on your website, promote a lot of uh, sustainable actions that you're doing or principles around pesticide use, uh, fertilizer use, energy efficiency, water efficiency. My question to you is, why, why would a large company like yours take on these big issues? Um, how do you engage consumers on this work? It must cost you more to do it in some ways, uh, but do you save money over time on these increased efficiencies, or what's your calculus for getting into the game? Yeah, so I, I kind of start where Walter did, uh, and I think Campbell's is a company in, in uh, transformation. It's a 150-year-old company, and they bought my company four years ago, uh, Denise Morrison, our CEO, she, uh, she bought a carrot farm that happened to be in the juice business too, and, and Wall Street and others said, you're out of your mind, why are you buying a carrot farm? And you know, her answer was very simple, which is the consumer wants fresh food, we need to build more of a fresh platform to give the consumer what they want. And so that transformation, which I think started when Denise actually became CEO and has accelerated, I think there's a couple of, of core things that happened. Uh, first and foremost, much like Walter <coughs> described, uh, she took the whole company and went, went through a values exercise about what people in the company believed was the purpose of the company. And really going all the way back to the roots of the company, John Dorrance founded Campbell's Soup 150 years ago, and they went into the archives, and they found a couple of interesting things. Uh, he had some principles, uh, which actually are as true today as they were 150 years ago. He wanted products that had ingredients that you would find in your kitchen. He wanted affordable uh, food for the average person. And, and he wanted to create convenience. Really, you think about condensed soup, but it was really about getting people vegetables at a time of the year, most of the country, where you couldn't get to vegetables. That's what actually generated the idea of condensed soup. Very interesting. So that history was brought forward, and we worked very hard to establish a new kind of purpose around real food that, that matters. And real food that matters um, seems simple, but it, there's really two parts to it, right? Real, real food, how do you define real food? Yeah. Many of the things Walter was just talking about. And then that matters is how you grow it, how you bring it to market, how you interface with, with your stakeholders to ensure that it's delivering value to them. That work then translated, I think, into a totally different set of screens around the questions you're asking. Yeah. So the screens became more values-based screens and less economically-based screens. Mm -hmm. Now, there's economics to all of this, uh, but at the end of the day, we said, look, um, let's just take GMO labeling. The industry was working on it, working on it, working on it. You know, there's a lot of people. There was a lot of noise in the market. And, and we looked at it, and, and Denise made a decision right after the first of the year that we would go and label our product. We wouldn't wait for the process because we felt like, there was no guarantee the process was going to come to a reasonable place. And our, our consumers were very clear. 
they wanted to understand at, at a very high number. Remember, it's very. Uh, How did you hear from your consumers? They, oh, every they way in, possible. Uh -huh. You know, <laughs> the, 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 great, the great thing about today is there's so many ways to talk. You know, to people. I don't, I don't even like the word consumer. But they talk to people. They, you know, email, social media, and you can mine all that, and it becomes very clear what the themes are. Mm -hmm. And this this idea of GMO labeling was very clear that they they wanted to know what was in their food, where it came from, what had been done to it, and. Um, that was uh, unassailable. It was, an, I think the number was 92%. It was, again, similar to these numbers. Wow. When you're staring at that number and if you believe you're in the business of serving your customer, uh -huh. uh, you, you can't ignore that. You and, and so that decision actually became um, pretty clear. We're, you know, in the process of labeling all of our products that have GMOs, very simply said made with genetically modified ingredients. And We're gonna get to GMOs in a little bit, so I'll let you dig down even deeper on okay. that, Jeff. I don't wanna give props to Campbell though, because they were the first major CPG company to come out and label, Absolutely. voluntarily label their products. And uh, if you go on their website, whatsinyourfood.com, it's an excellent example of a major company getting transparent about what's in their food. I was, I, I mean, Denise told me she had piles of letters in her office from customers writing her, but that was incredible what Campbell's did in terms of this whole Evolution. They really set an example, and the next company that was after that was there was quite a bit of a gap in time, so it took a real step of courage. And I think I think these changes like this, uh, it does take it does take leadership and courage, and and Campbell's displayed it in this case. Absolutely, and we'll dig down a said. little bit on that. Um, but before we dig down on that, I want to stick on consumer demand because mm -hmm. it is really, I mean, supply and demand and. Um, I know we've worked on the demand side for a long time and trying to shift that. You all are really on the supply side of things, um, using demand as a driver. Um, so Walter, is Whole Foods seeing a shift in consumer demand uh, for buying? And you alluded to it a little bit earlier on your value tier, shifting and incentivizing producers to move up the value tier chain. Are consumers moving along that same chain as well? Are more consumers buying sustainable product? Is your base of consumers growing over time? Um, and how do you educate consumers on that? How do you uh, let them know what, what's going on and what new things are on the horizon? Yeah, I mean, sustainable is a murky word. It doesn't really mean anything, but it's a kind of a catch-all for all these things. But yeah. look, we're in, the, we're in a, a tectonic food revolution like I've never seen in my 35 years as a grocer where all the growth in the food industry is in the natural organic space or sustainable space, if yeah. you will, and the conventional food space is negative. I mean, you're looking at conventional milk down 3 4% year over year. You, all the growth and all the money and all the investment is shifted into this section. So there's clear evidence that the customer and the customers, not all customers, but, but the demand growth is in that side of the business, and you're seeing double-digit growth uh, across this, and you have, as a result, a lot more competition entering the space, which is a very good thing mm -hmm. in terms of food supply and for the customers have more choices. Obviously for us as a company, we're navigating new waters of competition, but it's exciting to see how the marketplace has changed. There's no question in my mind that demand is ridiculous. The grocery business in the U.S. is about a $800, million, $800 billion business. So, uh, and, and again, when you're seeing 10, 12% growth in this area and investment in this area, um, the Natural Food Expo, which is last year's, is, mm -hmm. you know, 75,000 people there. This is now the food business. Yeah. This is where the action now is. So, so that's no a macroscopic sort of uh, view of the market growing. Yeah. When it comes to the labels that you're selling or a label program you've started, like your yeah. seafood label program with yeah. your red, white, and, uh, red, right. white, and blue, uh, red, yellow, and green list, following right. Monterey Bay Aquarium on sustainability. You have some uh, of your own farm-raised uh, labeling programs. How do you know they're succeeding? What metrics are you looking at? Are you looking at sales? Are you monitoring those things? Um, what, what's your algorithm there? Yeah, well, again, you know, Lincoln said about leadership that sometimes you uh, are following your constituents and sometimes you're leading them, and the leadership is really doing both. And for us, in case we're a mission-driven company, when we see a need, we step out there, we do it. In the seafood, we started uh, first with Marin's MSC, Marin's uh, Marine Stewardship Council, Council which, yeah. which our team still thinks is the finest label in the business in terms of integrity. But we built from that, and we started building out a whole sustainability metric for seafood. So now in 2012 on Earth Day, we stopped selling red rated fish. We hadn't sold any since then, so I don't really know what's... Really bold move. We've been building out uh, sustainable species and we give the customer the information in the store as to how their, their fish is raised. And so obviously all of our growth is happening. And see, seafood hasn't really uh, 
grown overall as a percentage of sales in the market, but, but you've seen tremendous growth in these categories as people are moving there. And, and it's also happened in agriculture too, by the way. Yeah, so. I found it really interesting that um, I know you all were involved in, um, and the debate rages on, on organic aquaculture standards, and we still don't have standards. For organic and we still have people that are selling selling it as such in the United States, but it's improperly labeled. We now. do, except in California, where we helped pass a law to yeah. actually stop That's that right. early on. Um, we were hoping that would tip things, but it, it didn't. Um, but so all to say that you were very um, progressive about that. You tried to participate <laughs> in those standards and in that standard building, and when it wasn't going anywhere, uh, you sort of took your own route and created right. your own program. I think that's really admirable, and it's one of the few sustainable seafood programs right now that's on the market. Um, yeah, but although our team just told me that World Wildlife Fund and some others are now taking that uh, basic agriculture standard, and they're tr agriculture standard, and they're trying to codify it in something larger. I'm, I'm not totally in touch with that, but but you know, all we're selling is to our standard, and we started with salmon in 2006 because you've all read the horror stories about farm-raised salmon, mm -hmm. and they're true. Uh, the environmental impact, the use of chemicals, the densification of the fish, the, the use of alginicides on the nets. I mean, so and all that stuff needed to be addressed. And it is farm salmon in a way that held up the organic aquaculture standards. It's it's that very thing. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. Thanks, Walter. Sure. Um, Can I add one thing? Yeah, please, that? Jeff. You know, from from demand standpoint, now looking at this over 30 years, what's interesting to me is step changes in progressive. Let's just say progressive labeling and making changes in the sustainability of your products. Just take carrots. We're about 25% organics today, 75% uh, conventional. But our organic carrot business continues to grow high double digits. This is true of produce in general. Mm -hmm. And our conventional business has been down. And even within our conventional business, what we hear from people is they want to reduce pesticide exposure. They want to know that we're putting minimal inputs. They want to know that we're being responsible water. And because we're a large producer, we can use technology to really figure those things out. And we've been doing that for a long time, um, you know, measuring well water, th things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and at the heart of it, I, I think this intersection of labeling and technology becomes really important here because if, if you don't have the opportunity to make a wholesale change, take all the conventional <coughs> agriculture and move it to all organic tomorrow, which is problematic yeah. for your conversion, but you can then take the conventional and you can drive better practices into the conventional while you're in the process of, of migrating. And, and I think the thing labeling does, positive labeling, is it actually accelerates the consumer's desire for those things. They might yes. not even known until they walked into a whole food yeah. store that there was different ways to think about aquaculture. Sure. They get educated, then they come back, they use digital technology to figure out more about it, and then they consciously make decisions to do something that from their standpoint feels better for them. Yeah. I think we can't do enough to create those conditions for change across all, all of people. I think that's great. And we're gonna dig into that a little bit in, in the last set of questions, that tension between uh, pulling the top up and bringing the bottom up. So we're, I'm gonna ask you both a little bit about that. But before that, I wanna touch on, I think what you're, uh, you're, you were just beginning to talk about, which is your different lines. Um, and uh, let's just take your chicken soup. So how much is the cost differential between producing a can of organic chicken soup versus a can of regular chicken soup? You, you know, the, generally speaking, the, the cost differential, it's gonna be different literally by skew because the, sure. the, the challenges with sure. sourcing. But you know, you're looking at you know, somewhere 15 to 25 or 30 percent, and so you've got a real cost differential, and, but the consumer's willing to pay many times a premium for that product, what's been great in the last 10 years. That was a very significant premium 10 years ago, almost across commodities. Yeah. It's come down a lot and continues to come down. And, and you look at you know, my business in terms of Seafresh, we've got customers who are selling carrots. At one point it was all conventional, then they sold both. And Whole Foods is certainly the leader in this, but you've got conventional retailers now who've just taken conventional out altogether. Mm -hmm. And all they're selling is organic carrots because they feel like they that the serves market. their need. And, and what they've been able to do is, even though the cost is somewhat higher to them, they took a little price so they could pass some of that, but they're willing to take a slightly lower margin. And then we cooperate with them to get to an economics for that that, that works for that customer. Mm -hmm. So you know, from, from my way of thinking about it, it, it's less about the cost inputs and more about the vision and what you're trying to do to serve the consumer because ultimately, you know, even the fresh business has lower margins on average than Campbell's. Campbell's has very high margins mm -hmm. on, the, on their traditional businesses. 
But that's not to say they shouldn't be in that business. It's going to grow margins over time as it builds scale. And that's true in organic, biodynamic. All of it needs scale. And so I think you have to take a longer term horizon on this. If you just look at it on a quarterly earnings basis, and say, would I make this decision? Those decisions all become pretty problematic. So as you do look at longer visioned and you look at the base that's buying organic, is that base a new base of customers or is that base shifting from customers who were originally buying the conventional and are now shifting over to organic? Do you have I a think it's both, that? but I think if you look at the numbers and just take kind of big shelf stable categories, I think the first step is actually people migrating from conventional to organic because they have a relationship with the brand, they, they like the product, but they want an organic option. Mm -hmm. I think as we do a better job generally, it's not about any given product line, but do a better job in, in building the relationship with those consumers around these products, you know, our, our belief is that we'll start to bring in new consumers. If you actually look at kind of the center of store, traditionally very driven by baby boomers today, much less so the indices with millennials, much less, you mm -hmm. know, 120 to 80 kind of numbers. And so if you're gonna service this millennial consumer base, you, you almost don't have any choice but to move aggressively to deal with these issues because you're, you're managing a your business for the long term. Thanks. I think all those things really help drive the change. And so one more question for you, Jeff, switching gears a little bit. Um, we've talked a little bit about animal welfare labels, uh, fair food, fair justice, worker justice labels that are dealing not just with wages, but health conditions for workers. Um, has Campbell's thought about those spaces? Um, and um, can you talk a little bit about what either you've thought about or what you've been doing in those spaces? I think it all comes back to this higher order transparency and transparency is a strategy for us as a company and, and really what the NACE's leadership, what's in myfood.com, the things we're doing. Mm -hmm. Once you start down this path, you, you can't avoid getting into all these because yeah. you know part of the problem is first the discovery of you know really going to all of our suppliers and what are the conditions and, and going deep. You know, I, I worked for Coke for 20 years and th that's a good example of what happens. They ran their Minute Maid business and there was, this is a long time ago, but there, there was a lot of reports about worker conditions in citrus, particularly in Florida and Brazil. And because of the nature of how they did things, that wasn't necessarily visible to the procurement arm of the That's corporation right. until you went, because they, they were dealing with a broker who dealt with a broker who dealt with a broker. Yeah. And, and a lawyer told me one time, who will go on name, that if there was three levels of separation between the corporation and that condition that you were legally covered, and I remember it very clearly to today, and I looked at him and I said, you may be legally covered, but morally and ethically, you're bankrupt. And so I think what's really positive about what Campbell's is doing and what the broader food industry, I hope, will get their act around is driving more transparency will force you to stare at these issues, whatever they are, and then make conscious decisions and make those transparent to your consumers. Once it's transparent, you know, then you're gonna get a lot of feedback on what side of any issue you're on. Mm -hmm. And I think generally our intent is to become more and more progressive about those issues uh, because I just think that's where the market's going. Yeah, so I, would just, I would just say, yeah, there's, to me it's not about whether the companies are gonna choose. If they don't choose, the customers will root them out. I mean, the customers are ultimately have the tools and technology to find out anyways. And if you're not being transparent, what are you hiding? Mm -hmm. And um, you see a company like the interview with Cargill CEO, which was a mind blower for me. I'm saying basically people want to know where their food is grown and raised. And here's the ultimate commodity company, faceless commodity company, saying this is where the market shifted. So to me, if you're, if you're not moving this direction as a company, moving in this direction in responsible steps, you're going to be out of touch with your customers. You know, you're going to lose business. You're going to yeah. lose market share. So, so it's both uh, it, this demand is coming from the customers who are saying, I want to know these things about the food. Yeah. So now I want to change gears a little bit more um, and talk about GMO labeling. And, um, you know, people, consumers are often cited, Jimmy Kimmel did quite a spoof on people having no idea what a GMO was, so why is this such a big deal anyway? And it's probably true. I, as a scientist, uh, it's very difficult to explain that particular technology, why it's different from plant breeding. Um, and to understand the variety of ways you can do it. And then the constellation of issues around it. Um, and consumers don't understand necessarily all of them, and, and yet they want it to be labeled. And so it's an interesting juxtaposition. You hear arguments out there, <coughs> consumers don't understand it or it isn't understandable, they shouldn't 
there shouldn't be a right to label it or they, they, it doesn't need to be labeled. Both of your companies take a different viewpoint on that and it's really interesting. Um, so Walter, I wanna start with you and then Jeff, I'd, I'd like to continue on with you. Um, Whole Foods was one of the first retailers to carry- I'm sorry, the yeah. first. The, the first. first yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> thank you for that correction. Whole Foods is the first retailer to carry non-GMO products. Uh, organic uh, has that in its standards. There's no testing program for it. There's also a non-GMO verified label. Um, and Whole Foods was really dedicated to that. You as a company have also committed, I can't remember what year it is, to having all your products be non-GMO. Is that correct, Walter? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And, um, that's despite it being a very controversial topic. I'm sure you hear a lot about that. And so how did you come to decide to commit to such a controversial food and labeling issue so early on? Um, and, and could you talk a little bit about the GMO claims and your evolution, um, sure. your journey on that evolution? Sure. Thanks. So how many of you know what a GMO is? Everybody know what a GMO is? Genetically modified organism. The real controversies around the transgenetic uh, crossbreeding, where they're taking you know species into species, as as opposed to traditional plant breeding that uh, uh, Sir Luther Bubank did many years ago. But um, for us, the issue was around. Uh, our customers were asking us, "Is it is this issue started to emerge six, seven, eight years ago?" People were asking for alternatives and choices and information and. And so as a result, I mean, you have organic, which by, by definition is a non-GMO product. And the, according to the USDA, to get the organic seal, you can't be using GMO ingredients to produce the product. So, um, but we, the first thing we did is to basically start the non-GMO project, which was to create a third-party entity, which we helped to start and fund, which is, the, which is the entity, now there's others, where the producer can go to have their product certified. So the non-GMO project set up a standard uh, for you know, for the GMO contamination in the product because it's impossible to get to zero. Yeah. So 0.9. EU, by the way, has a whole standard on, on this as well. 0.9%. 0.9% to... of material. We, we set the, they set it up and we've started certifying manufacturers and products through that process. And so there's a number of them that are now doing that work as well uh, to give our customers those choices and the certainty that the product was produced, in fact, to the non-GMO label. The second thing we did, so that, that's ongoing and it continues and it's interesting, many, even many of the producers, and we have a large volume of product that have run through that, so you see the non-GMO label on the shelf now that tells you that that product's been through that third-party process. The other decision we made in 2013 was to announce that we would declare for full transparency by 2018. When we didn't take sides on the science. It's like in, in our business, the music you play in the store, the dress code and GMOs, there are theological issues that can't be solved in our lifetime, there's just, there are passionate points of view on all sides of it, and even within our own team, about progress and nobody's a Luddite and what to do here, but I think what we could all agree on is that the customer has a right to know. And by the way, this is something enshrined in law in 64 countries, including Nigeria. So this idea that it's somehow revolutionary or novel for the customer to have a right to know what's in their food right. seems pretty straightforward. So we declared by 2018, we would label and let our customers know what, what and, and so as a result now, and then Vermont passed a law, yep. it takes effect July 1st, as a result, the Congress has now negotiated a uh, man -man into our national uh, standard, which comes up for vote, I don't know, I think this week, what I'm hearing next week. We've obviously been intimately involved in that, in that process, I think Campbell's has as well, in terms of, you know, because it's a little bit of a patchwork, but ultimately I think there will be a, a man mandatory stable a label passed, which uh, which manufacturers will have the certainty of, and they'll have choices of how they let customers know whether their product contains GMO or not. Now, know that in this country, corn and soy, about 90% of the corn and soy are produced GMO in this country. So anything that involves corn and soy feed or something is pretty hard, unless you're buying organic, you're going to probably have the GMOs in there, if that matters to you. Yeah. But for me, what matters is the transparency, the labeling, the clarity, the honesty, about what's in the product. The customers deserve and they want to know and they want those choices. So our decision has been really to support the customer in their desire for information and their desire for alternative projects, products that don't have. And products. so thank you, Walter. And that's a good way to transition over into my question to you, Jeff, which is um, critics of mandatory GMO labeling have often cited that there is organic or there is non-GMO verified labeling and so consumers can find that and mandatory labeling for GMOs 
isn't really necessary. Um, and yet that's the subject of, of great controversy and Vermont has decided that's not the case. Um, and Jeff Campbell's also decided um, in a very progressive move uh, for a large company that that was not going to be the case. And you all have announced that you will voluntarily start labeling for GMOs positively. Um, on, pa in your on, pack. On, on pack. On the package. Which is the critical thing. Yeah. It really is. And, and I, um, it's a really admirable step. And um, I'm sure trade associations you work with and other companies have opinions on that. Um, we'd love to hear a little bit about feedback you've gotten, um, but could you also talk about uh, why Campbell's decided to take that on? Again, super controversial. Uh, I'm pretty sure you don't like negative PR. So wh why did you why did you take it on? You know, I, I I come at a couple different ways. One is, you know, as we talked about transparency, it was less to us about GMOs, quite frankly, than more about transparency, uh -huh. uh, as, as Walter said. The, the other part is that there's lots of these issues that there's debate around. You, you know, you you can pick any almost any one of the issues on your on your survey, sure. and there's going to be differing points of view. So it's 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 di it's difficult, you know, as a large company always to take sides on those. But but sometimes you have to. You know. Did you change your point of view? Were you against it? To, was Campbell's against GMO labeling mandatory to begin with? Were you agnostic? Where well, were you? Well, the, the, here's the facts. Campbell's did support through the GMA uh, fighting two state level labeling uh, initiatives. GMA, Gro Grocery Manufacturers Association. Grocery Manufacturers Association. Yeah. About four years, there was one in California, one in Washington. And, and I think that was actually um, a, a seminal moment for, for us because two things happened. One, our rationale, which was reasonable, was state level, <laughs> state level labeling was very difficult because if one state wanted you to label one way, and we said we need a national lab labeling regimen on this. Right. Um, and, and, and it just didn't seem to be happening. The problem with supporting that was that uh, we got tremendous feedback from consumers that they felt like, um, we, the food industry, it was an industry initiative, we're trying to hide something. And we weren't trying to hide anything, we're trying to get to was a labeling regiment that could work and was practical. And so I think that really affected us as a leadership team and, and Denise particular. She said, mm -hmm. we really feels like we're on the wrong side of, of this argument and, and you know, we don't, you know, we spend the rest of our lives debating <coughs> GMOs and their role in the global food system and you know, there's a lot of, uh, really interesting debate on that subject. But what we couldn't get away from was we had an affirmative obligation, you know, to, to give our consumers what they really wanted. In this case, you know, GMOs had taken on a life that was maybe much bigger than it should have been. And I, I think a lot of that is because the food industry was fighting it at state level. And that created, you know, it's actually what, you know, what you, uh, what you resist persists, you know? <laughs> and and in this case, I think it was uh, it was a great moment for the company. And as as Walter said, um, after the fact, what's fascinating is we you know we've seen very little. I think our positive to negative on this is ninety five to five. Wow, a very little negative on this, and an overwhelming positive response. And that has actually given us confidence to even become more aggressive in, in these moves, because I do think there's a seminal change that's happened. That's great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna shift gears one more time, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, and this is really about the uh, policies behind uh, food labeling and, and what goes on in that space. Um, Walter, I know that Whole Foods has had representation on the National Organic Standards Board. You all clearly are in the fray of animal welfare, worker justice, all these things that, again, we've talked about, controversial, lots of things to say on both sides. Um, and there are a lot of policy tables around these issues, especially in bringing the bottom up. And so let's get into that, the sort of conventional side of things. Um, I know that when I've been in Washington sitting at a lot of tables, either on antibiotic use in conventional production or feeding poultry arsenic, um, trying to get that practice stopped, um, or inspections and getting better standards in for meat inspections, I sort of yearn for Whole Foods to be at the table because when it's a bunch of NGOs sitting at the table, um, we can't demonstrate economic viability. And that's why in many ways it's so important that um, uh, multiple stakeholders are at that table because in, at the end, it's together we get the change to happen. 
and I, we, the voice that's always missing there is, it is possible to do it. We're doing it. It's economically viable. So, Walter, my questions to you are, what is the goal for Whole Foods in the general food landscape, and, and what is your role in making the conventional food system better? Um, and uh, if you could describe what barriers might exist for you um, to make you more involved, and um, are there ways we could think about getting you more involved? Thank you. I mean, I mean, I think that anyone's experience, if you go to Washington, D.C. the last 10 years, you want to beat your head, and I mean, this is such a <laughs> it's true. nightmare back there, and then they get all in the inside baseball and all that, but I mean, you're, you're more some... attuned to do that than I, but I mean, honestly, we've let our, let our stores and let our our, our stores do the talking in terms of, you know, um, I, I think it's all it's all important, but we've decided, you know, we, we don't have much of a presence in Washington. We work through the OTA, we work through RELA, some of the other organizations, and so we are active in those in terms of supplying a point of view and expertise. But, um, but, but you know, some of the areas, for example, let me give you an example of what's happening right now is the organic label. The issues being discussed around animal welfare and the organic label. When we passed the organic, I was there, I know. It was all we could do to get the organic standard passed, and Senator Leahy gives, deserves a large amount of credit for that. There was no animal welfare component in that, in that, in that label, even though customers think that there is. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're dealing right now in a situation with egg producers, these very large egg producers, who have basically have created porches, so within their confined buildings, and they're, and they're trying to say this is animal welfare. Well, ultimately, we know the natural behavior of the birds. They want to get out and hunt and peck. They need a certain amount of space. And so we've been in, actively involved in the USDA has, has, has up, done a rulemaking procedure to create a, a new animal welfare standard around that. And there's a lot of pushback from conventional ag who's profiting from you know, some of these things. And I, and I, and I think you know, the, the cage-free egg business is really emerging. They can go there, but the organic standard should reflect a higher standard. And so this is one that we really are involved in because we feel strongly that ultimately a lack of an organic animal welfare standard that will undermine the standard itself and undermine customers' trust in the label. That just can't be. We've worked too hard to establish this. So, um, I mean, you know, I think the Washington proceeds incrementally. <clears throat> we prefer to, <clears throat> to proceed by taking a clear stand on something and putting a stake in ground, setting a standard, what we think is the right thing to do after we studied an area. You know, I mean, farm worker health is another one that there are still areas of farm worker slavery in the United States, hard to believe, but it's true in certain states. And ultimately, the transparency arc is going to take us to people appreciating what's going on in the production of food, and they're going to value uh, the cost to produce food. This is one of the things that's most frustrating for me is that the quality and the price, people want to talk about price, 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 but they don't want to talk about how the food is produced. Yeah. And this is a very difficult issue, and obviously you can fall out on different sides of it, and we have done our share of work to try to, uh, you know, we're building grocery stores in underserved communities because we can see the disparity of, of food access. But I'm wandering around with your question. Yeah, I know, and cost a is a question, big shoot. So I want to maybe I mean, we will be, you know, I mean, it's just, we, we don't have a real Washington presence. I mean, I, I just think that a lot of companies do have full-time people there who are lobbying and all that. We do have our connections. I mean, we're involved, and on those things where we think it really matters, we'll get involved and show in, but we try to work through the trade associations and on some of those well, things. Well, we'll be in touch. Oh, okay. All right. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, could uh, we put up the third slide, please? I want to get into the natural label for a little bit. And, which means um, absolutely nothing. Which means absolutely nothing. It's a useless label. Uh, it is not defined. And we at Consumer Reports actually have a campaign to ban this label. We have submitted 250,000 signatures to the government. We've asked both the USDA and the FDA to stop it. Uh, or define it so highly meaningful that it can't mislead consumers. And this is another one of our survey slides, and the, the dark blue bar represents what consumers today think natural means, and this is on processed foods. It's very comparable to uh, fresh foods and animal-based uh, foods and meat. But you can see that nearly two-thirds of think now that natural means no pesticides, no artificial materials or chemicals, no artificial ingredients or colors, and no GMOs. And when you ask them what they think it should mean, uh, you have an overwhelming majority, over 80% don't want any of those things in products labeled as natural. And yet, basically all of those things are allowed in processed foods. Um, okay, we can take that slide off. And now, Jeff, I'm gonna put you in the hot seat a little bit, which is that 
in May of 2013, Campbell's, uh, which then owned Prego, I don't know if you still own Prego, uh, was sued for the all-natural claim, which alleged use of uh, GMO oils and therefore claiming to be misleading. And Campbell's argued it wasn't doing anything illegal, which you were not, because the government has no standards. Um, there's lots of lawsuits now in natural um, that are tying up the courts. And, um, and there are none. But the question to you, Jeff, is how did Campbell's address it? Do you still use the natural label? And who should be accountable for meaningful labeling out there? Is it the companies? Is it the government? Um, and do companies like Campbell's want to play a role in defining meaningful labeling or setting a floor? Or would you prefer the government set a regulation for all companies to follow? Lots of questions there. <coughs> um. So, excuse me. <coughs> All right. Is this cottonwood stuff? Do you have anybody else? Uh, I got it too. It's your last question, Jeff. Uh, natural. Um, as Welch said, natural doesn't mean anything today. I think that it's, it's probably the ultimate um, example of what um, the intersection of bad labeling and, and the marketing uh, world we live in today. If you give marketers across the board the opportunity to latch onto a word they think positions them in a positive light, they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. It's what they're trained to do. And natural, you know, exploded with, it got put on a lot of different products. And without a standard, you ended up with um, a lot of confusion in the marketplace. That then translated into a cottage industry uh, all over the country, particularly in California and a few other states around class action lawsuits around the natural label. We've, we've had multiple ones of those. So we, we made the decision to take it off of all of our products. Uh, be you did. Because we, we felt like the, la the ambiguity, it wasn't doing anything for us ultimately. And, and we felt like you know, we had a reason for, you know, using the natural label on some products, including bolt house juices and some other things. But at the end of the day, uh, we made a decision it, it wasn't worth it. Um, and ultimately, it really makes the case why you need clarity and precision and science behind these things to say if we're going to have a label like that, th there needs to be something behind it because otherwise, I think it just continues to erode trust, certainly in big food, but I think the food system generally. So the, to go to the second part of your question, having spent um, the last six years really working with Let's Move and the First Lady and, and trying to create a, a, a different momentum in this country around healthy eating, especially for underserved populations, we need the government to do its job. Mm -hmm. When the government doesn't do its job, when we have gridlock or whatever it is in Washington that keeps them from uh, doing their job, and, but it needs to be in partnership you know, with the private sector and, and finding solutions. The most frustrating thing is when you go there, you try to meet with people, you try to uh, put uh, an affirmative agenda on the table, and then you hear their reasons for not doing it tend to be very much inside baseball political reasons that have very little to do with protecting the consumer. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at yeah. what our political system today calls protecting, you know, the people that put the people there in the first place to do their jobs. Yeah. And, and so it's not to rail on them, but it is to say uh, we need all of us working together for a healthier food system. And the unintended consequences of an unhealthy food system, the obesity crisis, the health crisis associated with obesity, and on and on and on. Yeah is a function of kind of post-World War II food system evolution, yeah. but it's also a function of the lack of enough comprehensive partnership on solving the problems. Yeah. So, you know, it would be nice if we could get out of this smash mouth world we live in and start solving problems instead of- Would Campbell's be interested in sitting at the table with us, with FDA, talking about the natural- you No, know, I, I think we're willing to sit at the table with anybody. It's, it's about collaboration. Yeah, we'll sit with you on that one. Great. Okay. All right, I'm holding you both to it. Right. Thank you both so much. Um, that's great. That sort of concludes our questioning, and we have 10 minutes um, opening it up for questions. And if you'll wait for the microphone and then just state your name. Um, we'll take questions. Let's start over here. Hi, I'm Tristram Stewart. Um, I'd like to introduce the question of expiration date labels. Uh, you have on the stage a manufacturer and a retailer. And my question is, um, coming at this from the outside, I'm British, uh, I see a plethora of different expiration date labels and there's no real way for consumers, even experts, to understand what any of them mean. 
And I suppose um, I, I wonder what has prevented all the big retailers and manufacturers sitting around a table over the last 30, 40 years to agree common terminology on two very distinct date labels. On the one hand, food safety label, uh -huh. on the other, manufacturer's guarantee of quality label, so that people can actually understand what any of these dates mean and they stop filling their garbage cans with perfectly good food because they see a date, they think it means it's gonna kill them. Great and question. What stopped that happening? And is the food industry ready now, regardless of any legislation that may or may not come in to govern that, uh, courtesy of Shelley Pingree, um, regardless of that and without delay, what is stopping you sit around the table? Great question. Let's now? get to it. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'd say it's, it's a dog's breakfast today in terms of the variety of approaches to it. So it's very unclear. And you, you hit it right on the head, which is there's a food safety issue and there's a quality issue. And, and, and the lack of clarity around those, if you want it, screens, I, I think is very difficult to dial through. The other thing that our current system um, then contributes to is a tremendous amount of food waste food that is still safe but is pulled off retailers' shelves. And in some states, you couldn't even give it away. It's illegal to give it away, and so it has to be destroyed. It really contributes to the food waste problem. So I think from our standpoint, you know, we've got products with this short shelf life as 28 days and others in our fresh business at 90 days, but that's about the most. And most of those are um, really around best of use date quality. Uh, so I think from our standpoint, we'd like to see a better system that is comprehensive and that allowed the consumer to make decisions, but also in integrated into that uh, a way to start to think about how we make this food waste problem, uh, you know, uh, less of a problem. Because with food insecurity, there's no reason we should be uh, throwing away as much food as we do that's still, um, you know, good, good food. So. I mean, from our standpoint, I think we're ready to engage in that conversation. Thanks, and I think there is a food waste session that will dig into this as well, and it's a great... Oh, fantastic. We'll all come there. Great. Let's take another... <laughs> Let's take another question. Yes. Walter, do you have any comment on that? We just don't have so little time, and I want to make sure we get to a few more. I'm not well informed on it. I know that the I know I've read, there's legislation out there that's looking to collapse these dates into something that's, uh, I think it raises the broader question about a lot of this labeling stuff is, what does the customer actually understand? We can set standards, we can set labels, but how does the customer actually use it and understand it, which is a, <clears throat> what's the education on? That's a much bigger thing. That's kind of where you come in. So I'm not as well informed on that at the present time to really add. I do know that a third of the food produced and we talked about this last night, is wasted in the United States. So there's a whole campaign that you guys will probably talk about on your, on your panel. You've Big issue, the and, panel. The, and the UN's yeah. weighing in on too, so. Okay, great, next question, please. Hi, my name is Catherine Tickner. Thanks so much for your um, panel today. Uh, we've touched on, of course, underserved populations, um, and specifically I'm thinking of the issues of health literacy, uh, which may, may make not just GMOs, but even issues such as um, a carbohydrate difficult in some cases to understand, and also digital literacy. So for these populations um, who may not have the same access to technology to make their voice heard, how do you make sure that those labels are clear to them and that they're able to express their um, preferences to you all? Uh, I'll take one. I'll take one whack at it. I mean, it's actually a much greater problem than the label. It's actually just the access. There's close to 7,000 areas in America that don't have uh, fresh food access, as you and I enjoy. You can go to the USDA ERS website, and they're all mapped out. You can. It's a live map. You can sort of see how that is. And we, you know, that really bothered me a number of years ago. We tried to do something about it. We built stores in Detroit. Uh, we're opening one on the south side of Chicago on September 28th. We built one in Newark. Built one in Baltimore. So, um, I mean, when I look at those cities and I look at the, the health, the life expectancy in the west side of Baltimore is 18 years less than the city of Baltimore. It's astounding. It's not a labeling problem. It's, an, it's just a flat out access problem. The disparity of access to fresh, healthy food is stunning and morally repugnant. And we're trying to be a part of it, but it's a much bigger problem. So, and it's not just the access, it's also in my experience in building these stores, and I've been involved with them personally, it's also the education and the cultural relevancy. So without the tools to say why this is important, how to use it, you know, and then the cultural relevancy uh, around in a language that the, the, the folks understand, then it doesn't work. And so it's all those things taken together. This is a case where, through our example, I think we're going to be able to affect policy ultimately through proving that this, this works and we can do it. Uh, there's changes that need to be made in WIC and food stamps mm -hmm. and 
And, uh, all, you know, there's a lot of the surplus food. federal food that ends up going to these places here, the schools and so forth. There, it's a whole rat's nest yeah. of areas. But for me, it's, the, it's just more broader in terms of saying there are so much parts of this country that don't have basic access to fresh, healthy food with the, all the attendant health consequences. Yeah, I, I just build on that from Campbell's standpoint. We've got two major programs, one in Camden where we're headquartered and there's very few corporations yes, headquartered right. in Camden, New Jersey, uh, mm -hmm. and, and really around the city of Camden and the schools and providing not just food literacy, but actually helping underwrite uh, more fresh food in schools. We've just taken that program to Detroit. We bought a business there in, in Ferndale, and we're now rolling that out in Detroit. And, and our belief is there's two components. There, there is an education component, and, you know, and then there's an access to the food component, and you have to deal with both. There's and, a third, and it's culture and relevancy. And the culture and relevancy. Yeah. So we, we think that you know, this is actually a solvable problem, you know, but we, what we've got to do is, is make an effort, and this is where I go back to the First Lady. You've seen all the controversy over the school lunch program, which the fact that there's a controversy over it is beyond me, mm -hmm. because we should actually be increasing the amount of money we're providing to schools yeah. and increasing the amount of fresh produce, and you've got some folks fighting it. And you know, if we can't provide fresh, healthy food for our kids, regardless of their economic conditions, what kind of country are we? We've got time for one more question. Um, right here. Yep, you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you do, well, you do, though. You do. Thank you. And your name, please? Yeah. Hello? Hi. So my question... Can we get your name, please? Oh, sorry. Joe Raburn. Thanks. My question um, kind of dovetails with that, which is, in addition to in addition to you know education and availability of good food how about affordability i mean i think everyone in this room can shop at whole foods i know i do mm -hmm. um and um i think that the, the, one of the things that that is upsetting to me is that when you uh, read the statistics and you look at the profiles people like us are buying um 9000 skews we are reading the stories of the fish etc but the people in the inner cities, places like Camden, and shout out to Kim Fortunato and you guys uh, for what you're doing in Camden. Um, other than that, how are we going to bring this? And I don't think Walmart is the answer, but how are we going to bring this to everybody? Yeah. Well, you're, you've, you've got one minute, Walter, to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right. I mean, it's, you know, I will tell you, in being in these, many of these community conversations, they'll say, you know, Walter, we, we want the same choices that other people have. We don't want to have this some prescribed set of choices. We want the same set of choices. We have the same dignity, the same. And so, I mean, for us, what we've tried, we've really stretched our business model. We've gone into those stores. We've got much lower operating costs. We've basically been many times the developers, you know, help has gotten some help from the city to be able to actually build the project. So with our costs are much lower, we're able to, to operate at lower, you know, have lower retails in many cases. Or just, we're just stretching and pushing you know, for example, in the south side of Chicago, eggs sell for a buck a dozen. Who knows where the chickens were raised and how the eggs... You can't sell eggs for a buck a dozen and have it be any sort of a quality product, but that's what's available to them because that's what the market will bear. So we have, you know, you've got to just push and stretch and you've got to find that right balance between, you know, key items being affordable so that... Because, you know, if you don't have some of them affordable, they'll just walk by and they'll miss... They won't even get to the standards. They will never get to the stories. So, you know, we've tried different tactics to be able to make certain products very affordable and then be able to pivot there to be able to talk about uh, the stories. And, you know, some, it matters to some in some areas, it matters to some in the other areas, but ultimately the cost of food making, uh, you know, it costs a certain amount to produce quality food. It just does. Nobody wants to acknowledge that, but it's true. And so ultimately it's scale. It's ultimately these types of things are going to continue to bring the cost of food down, but it's going to take, you know, it's going to take... Uh, it's going to take a, uh, a push, just going to have to push into uh, making certain quality foods more. We're, you know, we just make less money on them, for example, on those, because that's what it takes to get customers to be able to try it. So. And would you do a tiered approach? I mean, you but you're already seeing the democratization of food anyways. You're already seeing, the, you're seeing through the fact that this marketplace is broadening. You're seeing the markets are working and product prices are coming down. Organic and conventional foods in many cases are similar price points now. This never would have happened five years ago. So I think the market is working in terms of making these more affordable. The question is, how low is low? How low do we want to go? Do we want to chase the dollar egg? Or do we want to not, you know, we, what's, this, what's the right way to solve that there? So We're going to have to leave it there. We've run out of time. Would you please join me in thanking Jeff and Walter? Thank you. And thank you.